teach in Pakistan. He went to Pakistan close to 9-11, and uh, in Pakistan after 9-11, all the people of the madrasas close to um, the area where he was uh, were um, arrested. He was detained in Bagram in Afghanistan, uh, which now is pretty famous because of al-Baghdadi. And, uh, and then he was transferred to, uh, to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, he's still in, and he's one of the people ready to be transferred, but uh, we don't know until now where. And the third story, just want to say the story, because I think it's really the core of the book, is the story of Salman al Uh Salman was the younger brother of a group of uh, three brothers, the older one, Fawaz. Fawaz was a real Al-Qaeda guy. Uh, he went to, uh, to Pakistan and then to Germany uh, before 9-11. Uh, he told the family that he was trading clothes, so he has a very nice business, and he sent home a lot of money. And the father was surprised. He said, from where is coming all this money? But his fault was it's never investigated very much at the beginning because the money were fine for the family. But at one point, um, he started to have doubts and um, he sent the younger brother, Salman, to Pakistan to meet the older one, Fawaz. And what happened, that this journey happened during the time after 9-11. And so Fawaz never was in Guantanamo but Salman was arrested and transferred to Guantanamo, even though he didn't know what the, the older brother was doing. And in this story, the hero of the story uh, is the sister, Amina. Uh, Amina, she got divorced. She um, uh, suffered from isolation. Uh, she gave birth to uh, a girl uh, while she was uh, in this situation, divorced and with no support of uh, her husband because all the family uh, was isolated, of course, after came the news that this guy was uh, arrested and he was in Guantanamo. And, uh, but she was the first relative of um, Yemeni Guantanamo detainees who was looking for, strongly for a local lawyer. She found this guy um, and uh, Mohammed Allahu, uh, who established the first um, corporation of lawyers in Yemen, were ready to defend the Yemeni people uh, detained in Guantanamo Bay. Do you want to see the? Let's see. Uh, we can show the video if we can. Okay. Okay, that's the trailer of the ebook. Um, um, the original uh, footage is the footage about the family, not the first footage that a lot of people they know here is from um, another documentary. But just to give you an idea of what happened to the people living in Guantanamo and uh, how look the letters that I had in my my hands. So, um, um, well. Uh, I think the story is, you know, is still going on because the family are still waiting. So the families are still waiting. Can can talk a little bit more, and then we should probably move to questions. But um, talk a little bit more about the experience of the families because I think one of the things in the United States that the the American press never 
encounters and never covers is the experience of the families of the men who are in Guantanamo. The person that I was involved in um, uh, named Mohamed Uslahi has a brother who lives in Germany. He's a German citizen. Um, and he had been living in Germany for 10 years without a single American journalist bothering to interview him about the family's experience of his brothers and <coughs> brother in Guantanamo. It's part of this kind of curtain that the Americans draw around Guantanamo in their minds so they don't have to think about the real emotional toll of the place. Tell me a little bit about the perspective of the families, what they hope for now after all this time, knowing that their loved ones will not come back to Yemen. What are they asking for? Yeah, um, as I said before, they're simply asking for a trial. They want to know if their relatives, uh, they did something bad or not. The problem is living in all this very long limbo. And uh, for them also, it's a matter of justice to know if one of their relatives did something wrong. Um, all the people I met, they said, I want to know if my son is responsible for the killing of people in 9-11 and so on, because if he did it, he deserves, to, he deserves the death. So basically, they are not, uh, it's interesting, they're not against the death of their relatives. They're against this idea of living in a limbo and the idea of their relatives trapped there because unknown reasons. Um, the second thing is to underline is that they, they live in limbo too when they are waiting for letters, waiting for drawings, waiting for signs, waiting for Skype calls. Uh, during the Obama administration and a little bit before, they had the, the option to receive Skype calls, one every six months. And um, everybody were very excited the first time to see the relative on, on the screen and try to understand how it looks like physically. But everybody that told me that they were so stressed and they wanted to cry, and especially when the Skype call finished, or to see uh, the relatives so thin or looking like, you know, um, people very sick, and also we need to say that um, the majority of them did um, uh, strike, a food strike inside uh, um, the prison. So um, uh, actually, they're still waiting for Skype calls, but uh, we know that maybe will not be any more Skype calls. Um, they, they are sure that some letters they will they will receive some letters again because it's an issue, it's an important issue and uh, we know that they need to have some contacts. But still after they um, demanded to the US administration to, to know exactly um, uh, what were the, um, uh, the things that they do to be, to be, to be in Guantanamo, um, now they don't have very, very large hope with the new administration, and they were losing hopes at the end of the Obama administration. Um, actually, we have, I think, only uh, Al Karama Foundation and Code Pink in the US, they are still demanding for um, answers and to understand uh, what's going on with the people in Guantanamo Bay. Let me ask about that. Um, your experience as, a, as an Italian journalist reporting this story, um, what is your experience with the American authorities that you tried to contact about this story? What's your perspective on um, the way they're handling this story, how, how much access you had to it? And then did you, you mentioned Code Pink. What about contacts with other Americans outside of government and what has their involvement been um, in this story? Yeah, uh, it wasn't simple to contact people who, uh, you know, who are um, um, uh, close to the stories of Guantanamo. I have contact with the lawyers, and um, uh, I have the, um, the possibility to talk with um, somebody who was in the program in Guantanamo Bay as soldier, and now has a very high PSTD distress for the things he. He, he or she, depends, uh, he did inside the prison. And uh, authorities, they, 
in general, with us, with Italians, they talk especially about people who are uh, transferred to Italy, like the, um, the guy who is detained now in Sardinia. And um, what I, I think is really interesting is the reaction of the activists uh, in US. Uh, Code Pink is an amazing organization, and uh, I met uh, this woman that became my friend, uh, Terry. And Terry um, has a sister, she had a sister, and she was killed in 9-11. And, uh, and Terry uh, realized after 9-11 uh, how much important it is to, um, to understand why um, all this happened. She went in Iraq, she became a great supporter of the um, Iraqi civil society, and she also went to, to Yemen, and um, she protested with the family of the Guantanamo Yemeni detainees in front of uh, the um, US embassy, um, asking for, for answers to, to the ambassador. Um, the feeling by her side is that she wants to know the truth too, because she has a relative uh, dead in all this terrorism uh, stuff. So um, I think she's basically in the same position of the families of the Guantanamo detainees. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, good. Um, we would love to answer questions from the audience if you have any. You must have many. Pick up one there. Um, yeah, we have a microphone. microphone. One second. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to know a bit more about. Um, I mean, the book. If you really try to put together all the experiences of the families and try to pass the message, or you were documenting the stories of the people, that the, the relatives of these families that are in Guantanamo, both of them, how, how the, the structure of the book really is. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, can we pick up a second if we have other questions and then we go yeah. to answer? Did, did Feel free one? also to ask questions to Larry, he has a very great experience. Okay. okay, there's a second one there. Uh, hi, I was wondering um, how you managed to find these people and if the US government ever tried to like um, obstruct you in any way or work mm -hmm. against you. Yeah, um, the structure of the book is um, the core are three stories of the three um, families I said before, uh, but I met more, I met six, and um, um, just to pick up three because I, I, I think that those stories summarize in general all the situation I was in, and uh, but there is a, a huge part of the book is kind of, um, um, trying to analyze what happened in the time of the Obama administration. So from the first um, installation of the Guantanamo Bay was X-ray uh, until now. I mean, until Trump was elected, basically, because um, everything was released uh, in November, in December 2016. Uh, there's a part and dedicated to um, prisoners who were transferred to other countries, like in Georgia and Kazakhstan, but I never met them in person. I just contact them. And a part for the lawyers who are defending, are still defending those people, because uh, also them, they face a lot of problems. And, um, and there's a part dedicated to uh, two soldiers who were in Guantanamo Bay. They served in Guantanamo Bay in a special division. And uh, then they speak out and they said that um, they have some kind of distress. And so I, I tried to, uh, to build all the narrative around um, the story of the three families, um, trying to, to give an insight on what's going on, actually. And uh, how I found them, well, um, I, I traveled to Yemen since 2012. I lived there six months per year. Uh, actually, I'm Yemeni because I married a Yemeni. So um, 
I have very strong insight in the, um, in the society, and that's the only way you can find these people and try also to understand dynamics. Um, I can say that uh, a lot of Yemeni colleagues they wanted to tell the story, and I'm very thankful to my fixer who actually is not among us because he um, was killed by a Saudi strike, al Migdad Mojali, who wanted always to tell the story, but he couldn't because he's a Yemeni. And so we decided to work together uh, as a foreign journalist. Uh, he knew that to have the possibility, the option to publish all this, and we did this job together for one year. Um, uh, those people, they never, you know, felt it was, you know, the first problem you need to to avoid is that they think you're a spy, because Yemen is for real. Is Yemen is for real a country with a lot of spies? <laughs> And some of them, they say, are journalists or, you know, so you need to, to be clear about it. They, they need to feel that you are not a spy. And then I never met them only once. You know, I stayed with them a lot and uh, talked with all the relatives and tried to understand. Also, if they, they lied to me, because I, I can't pick all, all the story for granted. So you need also to uh, to see what the CIA says about, for example, Abdul Salam al The brother of Abdul Salam al told me that uh, his brother was great, but basically he was Al-Qaeda man, a real strong Al-Qaeda man. So uh, the picture of the family about Abdul Salam was of course a good guy, but he wasn't. He has another question? Uh, yeah, no, no, and and another one, okay. Yeah, hi. I was wondering, do you think that this story would have been told if uh, not, because you said you were married to a Yemeni, yeah. so of course you have uh, an advantage, um, you came across these stories. Uh, do you think that um, if your situation was different, someone else could have written something about them? Um, to be honest with you, I don't know. I, I hope so, because uh, I think a journalist, and if you are try to be objective, uh, this do doesn't depend from your nationality, religion, ethnicity, but this is a country where there are a lot of, mm, a lot of sensitive issues, so the fact to be quite a Yemeni, and the Yemeni, of course, is a Muslim, um, create uh, ties and the people are confident with you. So I can say maybe with another Arab journalist uh, who is basically a journalist not belonging to US interest, maybe it will gain the same result. I would, I would have to, you know, to, to put in a note from the US side on this too, which is I, I think there's the question of the ability of an individual journey to have access and there's a larger question of whether that journalist has interest and in pursuing that story. And from the United States side, stories that had anything to do with the families of Guantanamo prisoners or the lives of prisoners who were released um, never even made it past the assignment desk in major newspapers. So, and it was very interesting because a lot in the US, a lot of news organizations and in fact human rights NGOs chose to think about these stories in terms of kind of uh, human rights principles, the question of due process, of holding somebody arbitrarily without trial, and not focusing on human stories because I think Americans had internalized the notion that these were all bad people, actually. There's a very interesting case where Charlie Savage, who's the, the leading national security advisor, uh, national security reporter for the New York Times, who wrote a great book about the admin Obama administration's policies um, on national security, including Guantanamo, um, about a year and a half ago said he went to his editors he said he kind of had this aha moment he wanted to go and actually meet a prisoner who had been released now this is you know this is 12 years into Guantanamo he's written thousands of pages about Guantanamo but it never even occurred to the New York Times to send its leading reporter to go and meet a prisoner who had been released and he went to Estonia to meet a Yemeni man who had been relocated to Estonia um, and he wrote this incredibly moving piece about how isolated this man was in this country, a tiny country um, with, a, with, with an unusual language that he didn't speak. He had no relatives there. 
Um, and, uh, and everybody knew who he was. He sticks out like a sore thumb, right? Everybody in the country, we walked on the street and they would point to him. And he's, you know, and, and Charlie came back from there and he wrote this kind of moving piece about how, you know, it just, how this changed the way he thought about the story. But it says something about the Amer way American press has, has really treated Guantanamo as a policy question, as a political question, but never as a human question. Yeah. Are we done? Yeah. So I think we need to, to stop here, to finish here. Thank you for being here. For any further question, just stop us and we will talk with you. And um, what else? Uh, for uh, English readers, the ebook is available also in English online. It's just an ebook, not our copies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.